Hey, hey, what is up? This is Tommy at Surfer of Life. I'm gonna talk about my next guest, who is Flavio Zernescu from Romania. And behind me, you can see industrial constructions, two chimneys behind me, not so high. For Flavio, for me, they are very high, but for Flavio, they're just tiny ones. He's climbing up to 10 times higher chimneys than the ones behind me, over 300 meters, He's doing all kind of different balancing activities, disciplines in high buildings, high chimneys, bridges, unicycling, highlining, playing chess, camping, you name it. All kind of very interesting and exciting activities. Flavio is a natural born climber. He has been a passionate climber ever since he was a little boy. We're talking about fear, controlling it, and how you can do your passionate things in life. Would you climb up on that chimney? I wouldn't, but Flavio would, and that would be an easy task. The introduction video is really a video, there's no talk, so I highly recommend that you turn on the YouTube channel or go to surferoflife.com to watch it, because there's no words to describe what this man is capable of doing. Please enjoy Flavio Zernescu. This is Surfer of Life, and I'm your podcast host, Tommy. Today, I'm on the phone with Flavio Zernescu, who is a stuntman who's climbed crazy high chimneys, balancing on bridges, juggling, unicycling, you name it, doing all kind of very exciting things. Flavio, welcome to Surfer of Life. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to be here with you. And you lead the show then, you ask me. <laughs> yeah. You are in Romania and I'm in Finland. You're on the other side of Europe. It looks quite nice right. out there. Is it hot? Yeah, it is. You know, uh, last week it was really bad and I thought winter is coming already. But luckily, you know, the last bits of summer came back. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I'm busy. I wish I was uh, climbing a chimney right now. The weather is so good for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> climbing the chimney. We're going to talk about that a lot today. Uh, okay. I'm I'm in Finland. We already had minus degrees a couple of mornings here, so it's the winter minus is really four. coming, yeah. Here there are twenty, twenty two or so, I guess. It's, it's quite nice t shirt. Yeah, it's <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Yeah. I'm so excited to have you on my show. Thank you for participating. I've been watching your YouTube videos and wow man. They are stunning and I really want to talk about that. But everything has some kind of start and you have an amazing balance you're doing all kind of stunts where you really need a good balance and nerves uh, what was your start have you been in a circus school or are you self-learned or how does it well, go yeah 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 so for the matter of fact i've been uh, working in circus a few times last time it was this winter this past winter i've been working in uh, um doha qatar yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, so I've been working as well as full time circus, but this is not my background actually. Um, 
this passion comes from just from myself from uh, like i was telling you in the email you know exploring i, I like uh, climbing and getting on top of things since i was a child and uh, i remember myself when i was like six years of age trying to balance on uh, pipes and chains that you find in uh, in your gra- in your uh, sorry in your backyard in your uh, <laughs> Uh, wherever I was finding something that could uh, make for a walk, for a balance, you know, I was trying it. So uh, it came progressively like this. And uh, in my early 20s, I started unicycling. I started uh, kind of late, but uh, I didn't have the opportunity to uh, to try it before. And this um, brought me to a wider you know, spectrum of uh, balance disciplines. And then I found out about slack lines and later on about high lines through juggling festivals and uh, all sorts of meeting, mostly abroad, but some of them in Romania as well. So then with the help of the internet, uh, I got in touch with other people. I've seen uh, what other people are doing. So, you know, we all have our own inspirations and, uh, it's just like with music. You listen to a little bit of Deep Purple to some Iron Maiden and then you make Metallica, for example, or then you make Slayer. <laughs> so this is how it is with me. And uh, actually with Circus, I think I got um, after, way after my passion for climbing. Uh, because I was already juggling and, uh, you know, trying to teach myself various skills. Uh, so, uh, uh, people contacted me and, uh, first I got into entertainment shows for events for this and that. And, uh, later on, you know, making more friends, uh, and coming to appreciate the circus art. I even got to be one circus man myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very good. But you worked at a corporate job, so you yes. haven't done only this since the early age. So how did you get rid of that job and decide that this is not my thing? So professionally speaking, you know, uh, when it comes to papers and licenses, uh, I'm a programmer. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, the school that I was doing here, uh, my uh, I attended high school with informatics degree. It was in the mid 90s. So there was no dream about circus or anything like that. Although, it was a passion besides school and everything for myself, you know, to explore. And I always had like a second life, my um, foreground life or how to stay my my normal life and then my dream life. And uh, these two went in parallel for many years. And the natural progression was to go uh, and study computers, which I also like, you know, it's not like I was doing it for for nothing because I have uh, I also, uh, I have a tendency to, or um, to understand things and I'm uh, more of a technical person. You know, I repair things and I like to, to understand. So computers was, was a good approach. And then uh, university, the same. So then, I, I had to get a job, you know, and what could I get at that point? You know, when I was in my early 20s, um, I got to a corporate and I, I spent there three years first time and then I got a U.S. visa, you know. So uh, I said, like, now it's a good moment. That was in 2008. After three years of uh, software developing, I said, like, now I need to put a break on this and, you know, try to bring my dream life more in foreground. And that's uh, what I did. Uh, and I did that for three years. You know, I've been on and off to the United States. I've been three times, actually. Okay. Uh, I made more friends. I uh, I spent a fortune on my unicycle collection, <laughs> on juggling and all sorts of things. But this was kind of before my YouTube era. This was before 2010, everything. So... Uh, <laughs> the irony uh, makes it that um, in the starting of the last decade, uh, I mean 2010, 2011, um, I've been through a more difficult uh, period, like uh, 
I needed money, you know, so I, I then I um, got myself employed again. Again in the corporate world. Uh, I worked another three years and then in 2014 I quit it again. And I said like this time I want to quit it for longer because I feel like, you know, we're not here to stay forever on this planet. So uh, I'm getting older, you know, I'm, I'm approaching my 40s soon and uh, I'm now trying, I'm valuing the, the years that I got in this, in this world. I'm valuing them more and I'm trying to be more efficient with them. So, you know, for me now, it's more important to spend time outdoors, to, to be creative in my um, way of, of seeing things rather than go in an office. And maybe later on in my life, I maybe, I don't know, I'll, I'll go back uh, there again. Yeah. So now I, I was telling you like how it uh, they wove together, you know, my my normal life with my uh, dream life, and uh, now I'm trying, I'm trying to uh, take care more of my dream life. I don't know what other words to to tell you, yeah. Because same time, you know, people think that this guy is only climbing chimneys. It's not true because I, I also do some other jobs, you know. I also work in uh, industrial rope access sometimes. Um, I I will go in, the, in this weekend to have a performing show. So now then I'll be a circus man. I'm a bit of many things, you know. I'm not uh, like 100% doing uh, one specific thing and only... <laughs> Yeah, it's good to do many things. I like I like it as well. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned you about yeah, you mentioned about nature. Yeah. So, nature, I suppose, then have a good impression on you. You enjoy being in the nature instead of be working in the office. Yeah, yeah. right. Totally right. Yeah, it seems it's uh, doing much better for my mood. You know, for my brain. When I see the the green, I, I can show you later. I don't want to move the camera right now. You know, I'm close to the woods right now. I'm in the town where I grew up and I don't have a schedule. I don't have a boss, but although I still have a lot of work to do, you know, but I'm planning it and I'm, I'm pushing myself to finish this and that, to repair my car and then to be able to embark on a new adventure, to travel somewhere. So I'm trying to set up my life rather than having it set up from from outside. And uh, of course, yeah, spend a lot of time outdoors and in the nature. I'm a summer type of guy, you know, and uh, whenever the weather is good, I feel like I have to burst to, to, to get out. Yeah. What about Romania? It's diverse. There's a lot of different landscape in Romania. Am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. We have all sorts of things, you know, from hills, valleys, uh, sea. We have the Black Sea. We have uh, lakes, rivers. It's a very beautiful place. Unfortunately, you know, the politics are <laughs> not so good. Maybe you know about it. and uh, But that's life, you know. So I, I'm enjoying Romania on um, my level of interaction with it. So this is what concerns me the most, you know, to try to... Uh, enjoy and interact with things on the level that connects me because you know there are so many other things that are not good wherever you go and now in particular case in Romania but I'm I'm trying not to think about them and you know like <laughs> we don't have the best roads for example we don't have uh, this and that but you know this hill like on my right side and the lake behind they are always there and you know you can uh, uh, you can create. So I have a relationship with nature. I, I just like that, you know, admiring it from different points of view. <laughs> what about the industrial uh, buildings, constructions? What's your connection to them? Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, in the 70s and 80s, I mean, the communism era left a lot of uh, industrial uh, buildings many of which are really, really tall, big, you know, giant, like uh, mastodons they, they used to build back in the day. And um, most of them are not running anymore. You know, our industry has been ruined and uh, 
it's true that uh, it was not green anymore. You know, like those chimneys that I climbed were smokestacks or uh, um, exhausting the, the smoke uh, resulted in the process of uh, making electricity or heat or or smelting, smeltering, you know, that yeah. or metals. Yeah. So there are still uh, quite a few of these standing today, you know, but uh, as years go, they are they are putting them down. So um, as a child, I, I've seen those working. I've seen them smoking those chimneys. You know, I've seen uh, this industry on its last uh, hundred meters, so to speak. Yeah. You know, and I was fascinated about those uh, giant domains, and I said, like, wow, I want to explore these one day. And it was an open dream, you know, and eventually, uh, you know, this is a long, a long story here, but how can I make it short? It's like, um, I dared to, uh, to explore them because as the industry is not working anymore now it's easier to get inside but you still need a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, um, research you have to do a lot of research to access these uh, structures let alone safely <laughs> yeah and um, yeah, yeah it's the dreams of a child put put into the actions of a how can I say? Maybe it sounds like of an adult, of a, of a of a man, you know, that I'm projecting my dreams that I had as a child to touch those uh, edges. You know, I'm I'm trying to do that today as much as I can. I mean, it, it, it's still an open list. It's not like uh, I had uh, a specific dream of. Uh, climbing that very chimney or something it was like i had a crush on these structures you know i, I really uh, i was fascinated and intrigued about them so it was just a matter of time till uh, i get a chance of exploring them so there's a lot of playground for you in romania have you ever counted how many chimneys there are actually uh, that you're able to climb yeah 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 there are uh I don't know, maybe there are 100 in Romania, you know, but uh, it's uh, maybe 10, 15 that are, are really tall, above 200 meters. And then we have, uh, you, you can uh, classify them in um, uh, height classes, like uh, uh, under 100 meters brick chimneys. You know, I don't really climb those, for example, because I consider them very dangerous. They are old and the bricks can fall can fall while you climb if you happen to move something or you know and if they fall on your head even if you have a a helmet it's mm -hmm. it can be very bad so th those are uh, like uh, less than 50 meters usually yeah. and then uh, in the 60s they started building uh, concrete chimneys so you find in many medium-sized cities you find at least one of those uh, chimneys that is uh, just under 100 meters or so and uh, those are already concrete but they are still old and uh, i climbed a few not many and then in the 80s they started climbing really taller chimneys i think it was like a, a race between <laughs> the cities or you know who has the the tallest and this was all across eastern europe if you go to poland to czech republic to uh, serbia as well uh, hungary you'll you'll find uh, these kinds of chimneys and uh, there are uh, there are quite a few over 200 meters there are maybe 10 or so over 200 meters in romania at this moment but not all of them are accessible some some a few maybe two or three are still working and uh, it's hard to get there but uh, the lucky uh, the the good uh, thing is that the absolute highest in romania absolute tallest uh is 350 meters third in europe and i got a chance to climb it i think three or four times now yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, I would have been upset if uh, that one, you know, was impossible for me to climb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your first chimney? What's your first summit, if we can use that word? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, in the, in the beginning, there was uh, it was not a chimney. It was. Uh, Actually, towers, the metal towers, like those that you see for the cell phone, you know, but not yeah. the cell phone. It was a radio tower, which was already kind of old. I don't know. It was 20 years old. And this was in, uh, I was told by a friend because I forgot when. It was 93. So I must have been like 11 years old when I climbed that, you know. And then um, in my teens, I already climbed a few cell phone towers, which were 50 meters or even more, 50, 60, 70 meters around that range. And uh, I was very, very scared. I remember I was scared because not just because of the height, but because they are moving and all of them are moving. You know, you, you can definitely feel and you can move them yourself if you're uh, if you're not steady. I mean, calm, you know. So I remember when I was very nervous and then I had to calm down to tell myself, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys in Finland saw the uh, sun eclipse. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, it, it was, was cloudy in outside, so I couldn't see that. Yeah. 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 So I, I saw the, this once in a lifetime uh, event, you know, uh, I saw that it was uh, August 11th, 99. I saw that from... Um, a tower, such a tower, you know, a cell phone tower. And I remember a big wind came, you know, and that wind kind of, it felt like the tower is going to, to crash on the ground. I was very scared, but it's just a memory, you know, that will never go. And then chimneys came, um, came way later. I mean, in the last 10 years, uh, because you don't find so many chimneys as you find uh, these towers, you know. And then uh, even if you find them, you don't know in the beginning how to climb them. There, there was no record on, on this and where to check. So it was only my exploration step by step. And when, you know, the, the stars aligned on my sky, you know, when the right moment came, uh, I just... Uh, got there and climbed. So uh, chimneys were in the last 10 years or even less, like seven years, uh, mostly, most of them. And in the last four or five years, I, I, I climbed uh, more than I ever did in my life, if I add the heights together, yeah. you know. But this climbing, like I told you earlier today, it's uh, only a part of my interest in things you know so i i also started skydiving but yeah i'll see how much i'm gonna go with that i i have a passion for many for many adventure sports that can be done also individually or in small groups you know i'm not playing soccer for example football i'm not playing uh these traditional sports anymore although i used to so for me, it's just like an exploration together with do-it-yourself thing, you know, like when you're trying to repair your own car, your <laughs> yeah. sew your jacket, for example. So this is just a part of trying to know myself and to know, to understand the world around me and the universe. And You, you said you were scared at the beginning when we were younger. Is it the repetitions that actually got you more... Uh, familiar with the climbing and more self-confidence because I've been wondering, I see yeah. these videos and it it hurt my stomach when I only see the videos. So I'm wondering, like, how can you not be scared up there? Is it because of you started when you were a young kid already well, so, climbing? You know, whenever, whenever I climb something uh, in the very first minutes, usually I'm a bit scared, to tell you honest. Uh, even if I reclimb the same chimney or structure or whatever, when I get up there, it's the accommodation, you know, period that you need uh, like five minutes, 10 minutes and just to take it easy. And uh, once you get to spend enough time somewhere or to get the enough times somewhere, you know, you're getting used to it and uh, it starts to feel uh, more natural and comfortable. 
but at the same time you can cross the border on the other side where you forget that uh, there is still a big risk and you can you know fall of not paying attention so sometimes i just have to remind myself uh, don't push it here or you know don't run too fast here because this brick can fall or it can uh, it can slip uh, you know, fear is very interesting. Sometimes strikes us uh, because fear is uh, an, an instinct and is driven by uh, a layer of our brain which is beyond or before before the logic of reason. And uh, this kind of fear gets used if you give it time. You know, like a, your second self. If you give it enough time, if you give it uh, understanding, then it's fine. But then, you know, there is the uh, rational fear, the one that you think about. And uh, it's very important to uh, make those fears friends, one with the other. Because uh, I found myself many times not being afraid when I was supposed to be afraid. And then the other... Uh, um, on. The, how do you say in English? Uh, uh, vice versa. I mean, being afraid when I was uh, when I shouldn't be. Uh, so it's about using. It's about trying to understand what you're doing. Uh, so you know, like in programming, there always has to be an if then else. I mean, it's a branch like this, and uh, you have to make sure that you're respecting uh, the rules that are the golden rules. You know where you step how you see, how you look, and and this and that. And then with the uh, practice, you can increase the difficulty, you can add uh, degrees of motion, of skills, of whatever. Like I mean, juggling, you can juggle. But, uh, you know, whenever I juggle on a chimney, I look at it uh, focused. I, I'm focusing my vision on the chimney. Forget the balls, you know, they are not so important. If they happen to fall, they fall, but I have to be fixed and connected with my vision to the chimney. But then with practice, you learn how to put these together and, and see the balls uh, much enough for to keep them, to keep the track of them. And uh, yeah, fear, fear is very good. I mean, when you're not uh, scared at all, then it's a very dangerous day. So it's uh, better to control the fear than get rid of it, right? Yes, it's yes, to control and to give it time. We, we, you know, we are all different. Some people are very scared uh, naturally, and it may take them longer, or they may not even want to do it. Uh, some other people are not scared at all, but uh, you, you just have to listen to your inner self and uh, know what you want to achieve, know what you want to, uh, what you can do already. You know, I'm here. I mean, this point, I want to reach the other point. Then uh, how, how much do I want to do this? If I really want to do it, then I'm going to find the steps that take me there. And yeah, fear is part of the game. You know, like uh, joy is also, you know, excitement. All these feelings, primary feelings that all people have, you know, wherever you are, even on the ground or in bed or in a swimming pool, you can encounter these feelings. And uh, climbing, you know, is just one way of doing it. It's not the only way or not the best way or that, the worst way. It's just one way. Control your, controlling your emotions and your fear up there when climbing or doing the balancing things pretty in high, high spots. Do uh, you think it helps you in your regular everyday life to control your uh -huh. emotions? But well, this is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very good question. Uh, I uh, I don't think there is necessarily a strict connection between the outer balance and the inner balance of the soul. You know, uh, me even as a child, I was uh, more of a drifting person with my mood. You know, sometimes I get sadness. I'm I'm not. Uh, uh, very happy person, so to speak. You know, I I'm happy uh, and I'm I'm sad. I mean, I have all these feelings. I have to acknowledge. Sometimes I'm very sad, and I don't even know why. And I can be. Um, so uh, 
I cannot tell you or anybody that uh, I became a much happier person, but I become a fuller person. You know, I uh, I am very grateful to these experiences that I had, and I know they enriched my life, but. The, I don't think they can change your personality to the point, you know, I mean, if you are uh, meant to be depressive, for example, you will still encounter this. And, uh, you know, like they say, after bad times, good times come. But, you know, the, the reverse is also true in life. Uh, and after good times, there come bad times. Like I remember the year 2014 when everything was so good, you know, I had so nice adventures and you know, you get high with your life, with everything, with your projects. And then uh, you're expecting this trend to continue forever. And it just doesn't go like that. You know, in 2015, for example, I was down. I was down and then I injured myself in the middle of the, in the summer 2015. I injured, I fall stupidly, you know, like close to the ground, a few meters off the ground. Stupidly, but... Uh, I felt bad enough that uh, I still have pain on my back even today, you know. So it's all sorts of things that consume me. It's not necessarily the climbing. Because if I didn't have this climbing, I would definitely have something else. I'm the person that is in very big need of having uh, um, hobbies and of exploring. I'm an explorer as a person, natural born. You know, I'm an explorer. If there were no chimneys, maybe I would just climb uh, mountains, 8,000 meters or so, which I don't do now because I don't like cold weather. So I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't know if I reached uh, much further with my life, emotionally speaking, but uh, I, I experienced very valuable feelings which I'm happy that I did. You think it was good that you got injured? Of course, it's never good to get injured, but uh, in sort of speaking, you said like it was going straight forward, higher and higher and higher. So forward. was it a good lesson for you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I was high, when I'm saying higher, I'm not talking about the altitude. Yeah, I Because I did yeah. higher altitudes even after, after I fell, you know. So uh, I was going good with life and and you know i'm also not the most optimistic person i know that you know people forget people when they feel bad they think oh it will always be the same and uh, it's falling into depression and not wanting to get out but at the same time people who are experienced good times in their lives think like Oh, it's so good. Everything is good. You know, things will change. There is a guy from, I think, from fin Finland uh, who's talking about this. Anyway, yeah. so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, or maybe from Sweden or somewhere. Uh, yeah, you know, and Eckhart Tolle and, and these things. And so. <laughs> okay, so um, you've been reading Eckhart Tolle, right? Yeah, 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 I know, I know about these things. You know, I'm not following... Uh, uh i'm i'm trying to be myself but i'm trying to also distinguish from things that happen like you know clouds on the sky they come and go and uh i know in the very moment that when life is really smiling to me i know that maybe the next day hey life you're going show you are going to show me your teeth aren't you <laughs> you know yeah. metaphorically speaking so yeah, you asked me if it was good that I fell. You know, I don't think it, it was. Uh, it, it's good to get injured sometimes, not to forget that you're not invincible. But my uh, hope is always that uh, it's fine if I get injured, but then if I can just walk away and, you know, and analyze things and uh, be able to recover, to continue and have that as a positive uh, ex experience, so to speak. I mean, if you're breaking your legs off completely, it can never be good, <laughs> I think. That's too but, much then. Know, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're uh, uh, sustaining like bruises and, uh, and cuts and tears and scratches and this, it can be good to remind you. So I had quite a few of these. It's not like, you know, many people see my videos and they say, oh, this guy doesn't fear that. He, 
was very lucky till this moment and uh, one day he will fall and die. They believe like I'm a sort of a robot that, uh, you know, just came out of a factory and blindlessly go and eventually uh, blue screen and fall. No, it's not like that. You know, all my life I had all sorts of experiences, you know, and uh, feedbacks from nature. I mean, I uh, sprained my ankles. I broke my wrists. I uh, tore my shoulder. I, I mean, there's a very long list of things that happened to me while, you know, doing even regular activities. So I totally know that I'm a human and I'm fragile and, you know, and then risk can put a toll on you eventually. But this is not enough of a reason to stop uh, doing adventure completely because, you know, the perception of risk is a personal thing. And what others consider uh, terribly dangerous, you know, for me, it's reasonably dangerous. And uh, the same I can say about other people who are driving cars like 300 kilometers an hour. And I'm not doing that because I consider that dangerous and I'm not doing it. So, uh, you know, it's good to get injured sometimes. It's good to understand that you are not uh, a god or something, that we are all fragile. But at the same time, you know, with uh, some injures, injuries, you learn how you can avoid and you learn how you can improve. Yeah. Many injuries were really good in my life. I mean, breaking wrists was a... Uh, uh, a motivation for me to get into juggling and then i forgot that now I, I there were milestones in my life and this one the last one when i hurt my back uh was uh was stupid and you know it's like uh teaching you to be more afraid sometimes yeah talking about dangers what are the biggest risk factors when you are climbing up the chimney Obviously, you know, the, the highest risk would be, I mean, the worst thing that can happen uh, to you would be fall and die. But like, yeah. you know, the Americans say life is a bitch and you die if you're lucky. <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> you know, the risks. Uh, no, 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 if we exclude those um, uh, exotic risks, you know, that we try, you as a climber try to minimize, to keep them to a, a very, very low chance. The risks that uh, actually uh, give you some uh, <clears throat> encounters, you know, so how, how can I say, it, are uh, most of the time, you, you know, you, you can get a scratch, you can get a bruise, you can get like these things that are uh, normal. So when I climb, sometimes I have to step on bushes and it happened that I got a thorn in my in my hand, you know, or I got the cold. So, you know, maybe you're laughing now, but uh, it's these things that uh, I'm trying to to avoid uh, injury on all levels, all sorts of levels. But uh, this can happen. So if you're a very delicate person, I was talking to some others. They asked me, hey, um, what what should I be able to do if I want to climb or if I want to do adventure? You know, first of all, you have to be able to endure uh, discomfort. You have to be able to to understand that you might need water and you don't have it for many hours. You know, you're trying to avoid this, but it can happen. Uh, you will be hungry, you will be tired, but you have to work hard. You will be, you know, sore in the muscles. Uh, you may even sprain a finger. So these sorts of things happen and are very common, I guess, in every adventure sport. If you ask guys that are running on mountains, you know, they are prepared to have uh, blisters, to have everything. Although nobody likes it, you know, I don't like it. I'm trying whenever I can, I'm trying to to get back home in the same uh, condition as I was before. What about but, the... Yeah, the, these are, are risks, and then uh, there are risks of... Uh, let me put it different. 
uh, the approach is you always have to watch out for yourself, not to injure yourself, not to kill yourself, you know, and then you have to watch out for others as well. Like uh, lives are very important to save, not to uh, do something so stupidly that, you know, if you're up on a chimney and you're starting to throw bricks, you know, imagine if somebody goes down there, walks just uh, without knowing that somebody's up there and has a, a brick falling in his head. So this is about responsibility. You will never do things like that. And then uh, it's about uh, not destroying something or not moving things that can endanger somebody else. You know, it's, it's a code of ethics. And uh, if you're not trying hard to respect these, uh, bad things can happen. And then we can talk about the risks, you know, the risks. The risk is always there, but yeah. yeah. What about the chimneys itself? Because I've seen videos that you are climbing down to a very rusty ladder. And earlier in this talk, you mentioned about some of the chimneys that they are not safe. How do you know that it is safe? Okay, wait a second. The door. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, how do you know? Yeah, this is uh, <laughs> as simple as it sounds. It's common sense ju uh, judging, but mm. this judging, this common sense becomes broadens and widens with experience. The more you climb, the more you get to know, to see, okay, this holds, that this doesn't hold. You know, it's just like asking uh, a rock climber, how does he know that a spit that is put in the rock, you know, which holds the rope, is still good or is not good you know he will tell you that he's or he's hammering around it to see if the rock is still healthy and he's pulling on it and so it's kind of using your eyes visual visual inspection first of all no first of all maybe you take photos you fly a drone you know there are all sorts of things then is research is the ear of manufacturing uh very important also is uh what gases went around the chimney if it was sulfur you know then it's uh, su sulfuric acid it develops mm. so uh, not all smokes are the same some are more corrosive than others okay. and okay. where you had corrosion it's like uh, 10 times worse than uh, um, rust by rain you know like yeah. you know rusting by water and salt it's, was, uh, it's rusting in a solution, in a dilution of salt, then you get worse rust than uh, with uh, sweet water, normal water. Uh, and then when you have, where you have acids, it's terrible. You know, weak acid is even worse for, for iron than it's strong acid, as far as I know. So I've seen leathers that were rotten completely by... Uh, but these acids that developed when the chimneys were in function. So uh, then, like you asked me, how do you know? You know, you touch, you try, you bend, you uh, inspect by eyes, uh, and then you decide how much risk you want to take. Because there is nobody, you know, to call there like an angel and push you on the shoulder and say, uh, you know, you're, you're allowed, it's fine. It's a personal adventure, after all, most of the times. Sometimes you can have somebody with you, but yeah, it's it's a personal adventure, and you decide the level of risk that you want to take. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk about a little bit the things up there in the chimney on top of it. You do different kind of tricks there. You're camping, uh, yes. juggling, unicycling, all kind of things. Tell me about those. Yeah, um, as I was telling you, you know, I have more uh, hobbies. The truck is uh, making sound. Wait a second for it yeah. to go away. Yeah, so uh, as you may know already, yes, I love unicycling. I love juggling. I started juggling because I injured my, my wrists uh, in 2006. Actually, I started earlier than that, but I got more serious because of the injury to recover. So then... You know, when you have more uh, passions, it's like uh, a natural approach sometimes. 
when you think like, why not just uh, try to combine these? And, uh, you know, in juggling, uh, the juggling discipline in itself uh, promotes the um, approach of uh, doing combo tricks. This is a discipline in juggling. When you, for example, ride a unicycle and uh, juggle at the same time and maybe balance uh, an object on your head or whatever. There are so many examples here. So uh, if you're really passionate about juggling, uh, you will definitely uh, get into combo tricks. So uh, getting up on a chimney was like, I mean, the first time I had like... Uh, three fruits with me, I don't know, they were apples or something, just to eat them. And I, oh, I'm on a chimney and I'm starting to feel good. I'm, I'm giving you an example right now, yeah. you know. Uh, I'm feeling good because I already spent two hours on this chimney and I've been so many times on others and I have three apples. What can I do with them? And then I find myself, you know, juggling. It's just like natural progression, which comes from... Uh, desire from uh and from the very reason that you understand that you can do it at some point you just can't do it it's like uh, maybe it sounds selfish like you know uh, honda when they were asked why did you do this robot that uh, walks on because we could <laughs> so yeah it's uh it's just like that yeah juggling on a chimney is a different feeling so it's worth uh, on uh, experiencing on trying when you feel like you got to the uh, point or where uh, you are uh, in control of that maneuver, you know, because you have to uh, fine tune your eyes differently. And the same goes with the unicycle, because with, with this answer, I, I answer all your other questions is unicycle and then slackline, you know, slackline, uh, take this sports. It started in the 70s because of cl board climbers, which we say, now I'm going to try to walk on this rope instead of climbing. And eventually people say, why not just put this rope, I mean, the, the webbing, you know, put it up in between two high anchor points uh, and make a new sport. So this is how highlining came. And then, you know, I took the highline and I put it on a chimney because... It, it, it was good. It stood fine in my backpack. I said, like, let's do it. And then, you know, uh, why camping on one chimney and riding on another? Because every chimney is a little bit different. They have their uh, particularities. So uh, not all chimneys are suitable for, for camping. You know, some are very narrow and mm. you just can't eat a tent, a normal, a regular tent. Uh, some others are maybe too easy for unicycling or are too hard, you know, because there is in this life, uh, you know, on the long axis of things, any person, any particular person is somewhere on the axis of anything that can be think of, you know. So uh, some chimneys for me now are too easy to ride a unicycle, some others are too hard. And uh, it's just like uh, finding, you know, your zone where you can do it and then is opportunity opportunity also uh leads the path for you to do one thing on in one place and another thing is in, in another place because i wish i could uh, take my unicycle with me in so many places but i couldn't <laughs> <laughs> how do you keep yourself focused when you're unicycling on a chimney i saw this video and it looks it looks crazy i know now i've been talking to you I know crazy is not the right word because you are really focused and concentrated and there's always a good plan what you're doing and you know what you're doing. But how do you actually stay focused when you are balancing on a fence, on a handrail in a high bridge or unicycling on the chimney or doing these kind of things? How do you stay focused? Uh, the, the approach, you know, practice is always, uh, you have to practice harder uh, moves on the ground. Mm. This is very important. So, for example, with a unicycle, I I used to practice consistently on riding on a, a rail track for the train, you know, the yeah. track. And uh, I've been going there uh, like on a daily basis back in the, the back in the day. Even lately, I'm doing it, but not so often. Unfortunately, I wish I 
<laughs> was doing it more often. So it's uh, this kind of training. You all, you always have to make sure that you can do uh, two times more difficult. Or I don't know how to put it in numbers now. Like they say in circus, you have to be able to run a specific number of balls for uh, uh, five times longer behind the stage that you have that you want to do it on stage. Yeah. Let's say you want to juggle uh, 10 seconds in front of an audience, five balls or seven balls or whatever. You have to be able to do it for a minute uh, behind the stage normally and even five times in a row without a drop if you want to be able. So the same here with the unicycle. When you get up there, you have to know your lesson from the ground. And then it's learning to focus. This is a different discipline which uh, you learn... Uh, in, in climbing and in slacklining and in, in highlining especially, where you know where you look uh, to keep the connection with the object. Yeah. As you're locking yourself onto the object, you're not thinking, hey, under me there are uh, 300 meters and you know I can fall and die. No, you don't think like that. You just think that you are here, you are connected, and that aisle of the chimney becomes your railing in, in that moment and you lock yourself and you put yourself now I'm on the railing and I have to do it and that's why you practice so much on the ground and are able to do much difficult much more difficult uh, things you know if you could barely ride the chimney if you bring it down on the ground how can you do it up there you know that should be easy any time of the day if you, somebody brings you the top of the chimney wakes you from the bed gives you a unicycle you have to be able to run like crazy there you know and at that point it becomes maybe feasible or uh, reasonable to to try and yeah. Here, so there are many layers that you have to work on. Do the chimneys have a different spirit or a vibe? Every one of them, they add, actually they look very different, even though they are pipes, high pipes. But is there a different yes. sort of atmosphere or spirit uh, in that yes. they specific have, uh, chimney? Uh, many, many things different to them. You know, they they have different smells. For example, some of them. Uh, you can even feel like an acid uh, smell, you know, or uh, sharp. Uh, because uh, when they used to work, you know, they, they brought um, particles, which uh, they had filters. But, you know, back in the day, those filters were not so uh, uh, good. Or, yeah, so they, they bring particles. And many of those deposit on the top of the chimney. So there is the, the dust up there. You know, the last one that I've climbed, I climbed it many times, but I just came down from it like a few days ago. And uh, has uh, some ground so, or gravel or how you call it, this deposit of uh, particles, which if they get in your clothes, it takes quite a few washes to to go away. You know, and you can feel your hands smelling about it and uh, they have uh, they have many different uh, attributes okay sizing you know and yes they are all chimneys and uh, some of them are uh, with more compartments you can go in between the walls and i could stay here all day long and talk about chimneys i don't want to <laughs> yeah yeah all technical details yeah what about that it seems like it's at least occasionally it's forbidden to go up, to go to the building and go up there, is it or is it allowed? Does it vary? No, uh, some of them, you know, a few of them are left there kind of, uh, you know, it's not very clear um, when you talk about a law, if they allow you. So uh, it's not very clear and you can, if you really want to go, you can go there and climb. But usually those that are left alone you know they they cut the ladder really really high like 20 meters high or even higher than that <clears throat> so most of the people couldn't even want to couldn't even attempt it because you know if you don't have some gear there is no chance for you to climb like uh like an insect on the wall yeah there is nothing that you can hold on to <clears throat> but uh 
many others, you know, which are in uh, sites of industries which uh, <clears throat> work or don't work anymore, they belong to somebody, to an owner. And those <clears throat> have a particular regime depending on um, what your understanding with the owner is. Normally, you're uh, definitely not allowed to just get jump a fence and uh, yeah. get inside and climb. But I, you know, what can I tell? I'm not going to give names right now. I climbed in all possible ways of legally, not legally, independently, uh, all sorts of uh, approaches. Because <coughs> some of them I really wanted to, and this is a big passion for me. But yeah, I'm not going to teach people now how to do bad things or good things. It's just uh, like in base jumping, you have to learn your or to progress your way on into doing these things and uh, respect the golden rules and you know be responsible whatever you're doing. Yeah. Is there any goals for you at the moment? Because you have actually climbed to the tallest chimney in Europe, 365 meters. <laughs> that's a tall yeah. one that's a really tall one you saw the video and it was actually it wasn't very wide it was quite narrow the yes. edge <laughs> yeah uh, is there any special goal at the moment that you're heading to that there is some chimney or something that you want to climb up or achieve well, something uh, i um i don't necessarily want to climb all the chimneys out there you know although there are quite a few which i wish i could do one day you know um uh, again it's not about giving names with these yeah but, don't give names uh, <laughs> there are there are some that i i wish i uh, i will get the chance on climbing you know uh, but uh if uh, this chimney list will 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 come to an end uh my my first goal is just to stay healthy to stay active and uh um <clears throat> not to get big injuries like i was saying in small injuries you know this is the fact you have to accept it whatever you're doing um not to get big injuries and then uh, be creative so there are more other uh, kinds of structures that i'm discovering and also activities and um my goal is just to stay out there and <clears throat> and explore and do more uh, like you see it was camping on a chimney at the time i was doing it it uh in my mind it was uh, like a very very cool idea so i said to myself why not just try to do it because i never knew that i would succeed in in, in doing that mm -hmm. you know it was my first climb on the chimney and I didn't have a drone to see how it looks. I was trying like, uh, trying to see what it uh, comes out, out of it, you know. <clears throat> so uh, I, I still want to do high lines in interesting places, bridges, and uh, I, I, I like to think about what I'm doing, that I'm, I'm looking for creative ways of uh, exploring the few things that uh, the, these skills that I have, you know, like unicycle mm. juggling, slackline, acrobatics. Uh, these are some of my core passions and skills that I told you I was working in circus. And so now I'm I'm trying to use these in a different environment. Yeah. When I was yeah. contacting you and trying to get you on my show, thank you for being here. Uh, I kind of got this uh, impression that you more live in the moment, in the present moment, than in the future when we were planning this. Am I correct here? How important for you, for you <laughs> it is to stay present, live in the present moment? Well, uh, this is another philosophic question, uh, the question that we can talk about. So uh, living in the moment is, is very important. Is not to let yourself be pushed and pulled by the thoughts that you have. Uh, um, but... I'm not the person that uh, is trying to achieve this uh, full time. I mean, um, when I get to bed, you know, I stay in bed and I I um, intentionally look in my future and in my past. In my past, I look because I'm I'm doing retrospective and analysis with what I'm doing. So I'm living in all three uh, how they say like uh, times in. Uh, I'm connected to my past, 
I try to enjoy and live the present and I'm also projecting to, to the future. The, there are different views on this and, you know, some of them are very idealistic or uh, if you take an animal, for example, he's only living in, uh, they are mostly living only in the present. But uh, I think this is a skill to learn to like... Um, meditation to teach yourself to be able to focus and to cope with uh, some tasks and some uh, uh, wishes that you have no not wishes uh, there are some some times some moments in life when if you can't focus uh, you will not succeed you know whatever it is and uh, going on a high line is one example of these you know you have to be able to let the thoughts go but then the thoughts can come back to you. And uh, when you're drinking a coffee, I think it's not a bad uh, moment to have the thoughts back to you. So um, what can I say about it? I'm not a mystical person. You know, I like uh, I was telling you about Eckhart Tolle and, uh, and Osho and uh, Sadhguru and all these, you know, I'm I'm reading about these. But at the same time, uh, it's just my basic uh, things and uh, ideas that I had as a child is it's not much that has changed yeah. I, I didn't I don't want to change uh, in a different in another person I don't want to change personality by doing this yeah. and when I started climbing I didn't change personality only some people that are you know just don't understand things consider oh uh, it's changed you cannot become a psychopath by or unless you are one already <laughs> <laughs> Do you use any kind of methods for the concentration? Do you meditate? Do you do any breathing exercises? Anything like this? Well, I do. I do some. I do some. I, but I'm a master of none, you know. But uh, we had workshops in uh, in uh, Lublin when I go to Slackline Festival, where this is a topic that is highly discussed. You know, like how to keep a focus for over uh, one minute or or three minutes to one point and you can try yourself and i think it's about practice again just like juggling just like you know auto stereograms you know those where you look through an image to see another yeah so it's uh something like that uh, sometimes your vision blurries you know when you're looking staring at a point and then you learn how to blink or how to refocus uh, quickly your eye muscles so internally it's similar, but I'm not an expert by any means in uh, in how to become the best, uh, you know, in focusing or or mental uh, control. Not at all. I'm not an NLP programmer, or I'm just uh, trying to work with what I have, with my resources, with, with and with the knowledge that I read from many sources. Because you know, uh, sometimes you can fall in a trap. If you think like yoga is the only answer to you being a good slackliner, for example, or to you being a good uh, man or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I think the answer is is within you. And uh, if you're meant to be a good man, you don't even have to know much about it, you know. Yeah. And uh, well, things are, are somehow easy, but we, we are complicating them and... Uh, Sometimes we're trying too hard to achieve things yeah. and you have to let go. This I'm, I'm telling to myself, you know, because I want I want to achieve this with my unicycle. And I want, I want, I want. But at some point when you want too much, you just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> have to let go, maybe. Yes. It was the same with climbing chimneys. I want to climb it this weekend, that particular one. And, you know, the bad weather comes or, or something. So, but I don't tell, like... Many times I can't achieve my goals, just like any other human. I have to be realistic and I have to accept that not all goals can be achieved uh, whenever you want. And some of them may not be ever achieved in your lifetime, maybe in the next, like a friend of mine was saying, you know, jokingly, like in your next life, maybe you go to, moon, to the moon, because this is another goal of mine, you know, space travel, I say like space exploration. This is my fascination. You know, if I had a success, and give me a ladder to walk to the moon, 
I will never climb a chimney again. I'm only going to spend time going to the moon. <laughs> That's what I have. Nice. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, you told me that you started already before YouTube. Now there's YouTube, and you have a lot of views in YouTube. I, I saw in this uh, tallest chimney in Europe, there was 13 million. So that's yeah, more than is. twice enough than people living in Finland, to be honest. <laughs> How does it make you feel? Does it make you feel different? Or are you still the same chimney climber that you were before YouTube? Uh, me, internally, as a person, I, I feel like... a. Now you're asking me, I'm going to tell you my, my view on this. Uh, I feel the same, you know, although I came a long way with uh, with some things that I never expected to happen. When I started my YouTube channel, it was just like, okay, uh, where can I post my videos? You know, Facebook was not mm -hmm. very nice with, uh, with this. And I said, like, people are asking me, friends, especially in the beginning, hey, why don't you put this video that I filmed with, together with you or I filmed you riding that wall? Why don't you post it somewhere so people can see? And I said, like, well, give me some time and, uh, and I'll do it. So step by step, I got into this YouTube uh, and uh, some clips went uh, went viral. You know, I've been doing hard work, uh, to tell you the truth, you know, even before uh, posting videos on, on YouTube or before any of my video went viral i've been doing hard work but sometimes i don't know how people re overreact or what happens with this internet you know it's very strange it's hit or miss sometimes uh you get overwhelmed like this uh, tallest chimney for me it was I, i never ever expected you know when i went there my first dream was to reach that top even if i couldn't film it at all mm -hmm. but then when you get more into youtube you know uh let's be honest you know it's 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 a good thing uh, a, a good reward to you that when you see like your work is somehow appreciated but at the same time it is criticized you know it's like internet is crazy like with music with everything mm -hmm. some people will criticize you anyway but uh i'm happy i'm grateful for that but i never made a youtube channel just for the views you know if i was doing that and i would start vlogging people ask me why don't you do vlogs you could get so many more views you know and i say first of all i don't have time for that and second of all uh it's like i want to bring visual content to the people not talking mm -hmm. because talking you know I, i do talking a lot with you now and with friends i'm just tired of my own talking <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I want to bring uh, images that worth thousands and millions of words, <laughs> like they say, you know. So uh, whenever I find like I, I get something uh, nice to share to the people or interesting, then I'm sharing it. Otherwise, I'm not spamming YouTube. I'm posting very uh, not so often like I should probably. But on my Facebook, on my personal Facebook, if you want to check, you'll see much more often updates with shorter videos of how I'm uh, cutting with the chainsaw, you know, like a normal life mm. of a person who is much more besides a chimney climber, I mean, like a human. Yeah. So I'm posting like how I juggle, how I uh, uh, tore my pants, you know, <laughs> maybe this and that. Yeah. And with YouTube, I want to continue, but my focus will, will be on creative and, and original content. I mean, like, uh, content that is uh, grows in my head when I go to bed, like I was telling you, or when I drink a coffee, then I start to think, and uh, of, uh, new dreams arise in my head, you know, new ideas. I always have ideas, many people, we all have ideas, but some of them are not plausible. Some others become... Uh, doable within years, you know. If you would ask me 20 years ago or 15 years ago when I started Unicycle, would you believe that you will ride this on a chimney? I would say, oh no, hell no, just go away, you know. I never wanted to do that. So it was a good surprise from life somehow and from uh, just persistency because I kept at it that I got to do it. Yeah. Uh, I like I like this because it's just that your natural way of progressing yourself and doing the things you love and it just sometimes it happens to go viral and you stay yourself and I, I really I really like this 
the way you do it. And I actually, to be honest, I saw it in the YouTube videos as well. <clears throat> they don't, the videos don't look like that you're doing it for the video. I can see your concentration, the whole kind of like wipe I got out of it was that you're really just doing it because you love to do it. And the filming is just part of it. Yes, I yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I love to do this, uh, you know, adventures. But throughout the years, I was always trying to learn and to improve my video taping, like uh, video editing. You know, I work. Um, I have a documentary already out. You can check it on, oh. it's in, on YouTube. It's a 40 minute long documentary. Uh, and I did that. Yeah, it was a bigger project four years ago. So then, you know, I got in touch with people who are video makers, who are uh, film directors. So it's learning uh, how to capture your experiences after all, you know. So you can you can also trick these, but I'm trying most of the time not to trick. You know, there is no special effect in my videos. There is no uh, tricking. There is no, if there was a rope, I, you will see the rope. There, I, I mean, I never Photoshop to cut a rope out of the video, because uh, with the slack lines, I most of the time with the high line, I wear a safety rope because I don't consider myself good enough to to take that risk. You know, hmm. like you remember when we were talking earlier, yeah. you decide how much risk. So then, with the unicycle on the chimney, I consider that reasonable within my skill level for yeah. for for that particular ride. You know, if I was going to ride something like a finger, you know, on, with the unicycle up on a chimney, I definitely need a row as well. Because, you know, the best journey always takes you home. When you're up there, you're not suicidal. Like people think, you know, when you're up there uh, and you know what you're doing, you want to do it right, you know, and then to get safe uh, down. This is, uh, but yeah. Yeah. It's just like with mountains, with everything. Uh, risks exist, but you want to minimize it. And also do your crazy idea. <laughs> to realize it. I cannot stay very yeah, much. Yeah, I was just about to finish this. And I was about to say thank you so much for participating in this. And that, because this is one reason I want to talk to people like you. Because the last time I had one base jumper sitting beside me when I was talking to him. And... Uh, it's yeah. very good that people, the listeners, understand that the things you guys do, it's very skill demanding and it looks crazy in the videos, sort of a way, like the crazy is not the right word, but you understand what I mean. But the skill behind that and the, the amount of work, planning, practicing, it's huge. Nothing comes automatically and it's not just guys doing uh, these crazy tricks without any planning or thinking. And it's very good to people to know. Because this YouTube thing and the video things, they people will start thinking about, oh, the people can do whatever, and it's actually people start taking risks without any any yeah. Good reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There, there is a big danger in the fact that uh, people now lose track of uh, um, a natural progression towards a goal, and they think like everything, you know, even these uh, magazines that advertise we humans as like everything is possible or you know my in, ju in juggling there is a theory um a refined theory of uh, you know they say practice makes perfect this is the old saying but in juggling they say good practice makes better yeah so nothing really makes perfect we always make mistakes uh and we uh, we cannot keep a trend upwards all the time. We have to understand this, you know, my level of of highlining, for example, is lower now compared to where it was four years ago. So now I'm not doing free solo anymore on highline because, you know, I don't consider, uh, I don't feel like doing it. I have to be honest to myself. I can tell it to you as well. Uh, and uh, I may even be done with that because I don't want to end it stupidly. You know, you can still do adventure. And in my videos, I, I never focus on who's holding his weight in less fingers. I mean, I was doing one video where I hold myself with one hand. That's fine. And maybe I'll do again. But mm. the point is not like who is doing the, the most risk is uh, is exploring and is creativity. And uh, honest creativity with yourself first mm -hmm. of all 
And with base jump, it's the same. I have friends who are doing base jump, and I respect them. I, I, and it's the same. It's up to them how much risk they want to take. You can want to push it. I mean, not even have much experience and try to do gainers and this and that. Yeah. Or you can be uh, more conservative. Like there are old base jumpers out there, you know, who are doing many many jumps i have a russian friend who's who has he's like uh almost 2000 base jumps you know that's a lot and he has kids and he's fine i mean he can still do crazier things in jumping that i could ever do because he has lots of experience and he took it step by step yeah, yeah. very very important point of view uh, if you still have time for two more questions and yes, then i yes. then i leave you uh, I always have these uh, couple of standard questions here, and one is that what makes you feel down? Uh, wait, I'm, I'm trying to take the sun a little bit away. Yeah, because, yeah. what makes me down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a good question. It's a deep one. Um, I get sadness just like uh, normal people. Sometimes from from uh, stupid things, you know, um, uh, like. Uh, uh, things on the ground, you know, there, there is one more existential thing I'm concerned about, uh, about the thing that we age, you know, when I see my dog aging, my parents, my everything, this is a sadness to me in itself. And you have to accept it. And I'm still learning, you know, about it. And I'm very nostalgic as a person to many things that I cannot even exemplify to you right now. Like when I was uh, in uh, primary school and just going to that with uh, my colleagues or I don't know, my first love or <laughs> these things make me melancholic and sadness can be from the fact that uh, I'm many times very stressed because I work, uh, I try to do many things, sometimes too many things at once and it's very demanding and you know, you just get caught in the moment and you're living uh, stress in the moment, just like, uh, we were talking before living in the moment can can be positive or negative as well you know you can live badly in the moment and i end up living badly in the moment many times uh like now i have to root cables for example when i get home and i already yeah. know that i'm going to uh, okay but this doesn't yeah. really answer your question yeah. let me um you know when i injure myself uh i'm uh, sometimes when i injure more seriously, I'm very afraid uh, that it can take me long and, you know, and I'm, I'm aging and I'm not recovering as uh, fast as I used to 20 years ago. So um, this uh, material form, aging and degradation is, uh, is connected to a sadness in myself, you know, finding... But, but now this is a very delicate question and answer. So if I'm trying, if I'm digging deeper into it, Maybe I'll get contacted by organizations <laughs> who will find me an answer. Okay. You know? uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we meet one day, we drink one beer and, and yeah. we talk, you know. Yes, hope, like, hopefully, but hopefully. But sadness, sadness is also very important and uh, you don't have to deny it in yourself. Mm. Sadness, frustration, these are all triggers. They are all very powerful uh, uh, feelings, you know, and, and emotions that can... Uh, we can eventually use them to create something, to grow out of Exactly. Okay, next question uh, is my mother. Yeah, that's... <laughs> what makes you happy? Uh, what makes me happy? These are... This is easier question, you know. Uh, a, a sunny weather like today, um, succeeding in a goal that I have, like, you know, even finishing my, you know, routing cables, building my new unicycle, uh, meeting a friend, uh, getting a hug, of course, climbing a chimney and getting down safely, safely, and you know. Uh, now the the bigger, you know, the the project, the more it gives back to you. As they say, work rewards you. No, uh, work rewards you on the long term, hard work. But then um, laziness rewards you instantly. That's why so many people are lazy, <laughs> because you get reward instantly. But the reward is this big, you know. So. Yeah, exactly. Many things make me happy. Thank you so much. You are a courageous and a wise yeah. man. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Thank you, Thank Flavio. you too.
for everything. And yeah, I could stay here and talk. You see, I'm I'm talking a lot, but now I, I have to go because right. uh, right. I have to finish. Enjoy Look, your I day. Show you. oh, yeah. I show you here.